like seven minutes early. Oh, we're starting. All right. Do you see? Um, not yet, but I'm about to get out of the live producer, so I can. <laughs> okay. Hi there. Hey. Hold on. Let's see. Let's see. Page. Page. There's a Come few on. little, maybe I can get rid of the box. It's okay. People have boxes. What? <laughs> Where do I live that I don't have a box or two? It was so funny when you came over and you said, Erica, that's very nice what you cleaned up, but <laughs> that's not really. <laughs> you get the one, two, three start and you go live? Yeah, it's 36 seconds into it now. Don't you see me? I do not. Oh, that's not good. Wait, wait, oh. oops. Okay, end live video. I'm, I have five viewers though. Okay, oh. I was like, let me check on, see if I see you. Wait, did you end the live? It says five viewers, one reaction. And okay. Little, what's the, a thumbs up? And there's okay. been one share. You sure? Um, so, um, okay, let me try to get myself a little organized because I was so taken with this task that, um, um, Okay, so we're almost so, there. Yeah, other people are seeing you. It's just yes. me, yes. apparently. <laughs> can see and hear. Oh, good. I'm glad I can be seen and heard. We've gotten that together. But everybody else can see me, it appears. Okay, so you have people coming in? Yes, I can see seven viewers now. Okay. Mm hmm. All right. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, I, I hear I'm here. I, I see you too. Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Now we're. Oh, a lot of we can see is happening. Okay. A lot of lots happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, I think we're on. Good. In text communication, if there's any, any any further excitement, I will. I'll certainly let you know. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Stay, stay here. I'm about to share this with some people. Bye bye. Bye.
So I guess I'll begin. So I guess I will begin. I'm Erica Hunt, and I'm so pleased to be reading for Furious Flower Poetry Center. Um, one of my favorite um, institutions that gives a home and a voice for Black poetry. Um, I came across Furious Flower and the wondrous uh, Dr. Joanna Gabin. Mm. I think it was the, um, an anniversary celebration. So maybe 10 years ago. Um, and I just marveled. I think I marveled at all that had been created and stewarded and loved about black poetry. And I've been a fan ever since. And, um, and of course, when I, as a, as a poet, someone who's been writing for a very long time, I always like to say I've kept journals for 52 years. It's a long time <laughs> since I was a girl and writing poems much of the time and reading poetry. And I think about the current abundance of black poetry and poets right now and black writers. And I think we have so much to thank um, Dr. Gabin and Lauren Allen, thank you also for inviting me. Um, and Kaveh Kanem, we have a lot to be grateful for, um, as well as many other places that have been almost sanctuary, a special kind of sacred place for black poetry and nurturing those voices and nurturing the voices of the past and connecting them to the present. Um, I also, um, now that I'm at this place of still writing and still exploring and still feeling excited about poetry, I am also was very honored to be asked to be the judge of the Furious Flower um, Poetry Contest for 2020. And, um, and I just had the pleasure of meeting both the winner of that contest and the finalist, Oriel Marie and Jennifer Bartel Boykin. And I thought I would begin today's reading by reading a little bit of each of these exquisite poets, poems, because as I said, they're light. They are light, they provide light in this world for me. So, reading first from Oriel Marie's poem, Girl Gospel Two, and so we were brave. Our Egon's play open their wrists and hunt for sapphire. Archeologist for us, our Egon, painting our bodies red with Georgia sludge. Our Egon menses, flint and knives, small signs of life. Our Egon mouths of fire, of flies. Egon like lightning bugs, turning night into a June. Transforming our many deaths into inheritance, defying the cleavers and tar, the barbed wire, the boiling oil, the torch fire, the porch bombs, the addled calls, the severed brake lines or draggings behind wagons, the drowned or thrown down the well, bodies worthy of golden rue, of promises like gentle or patience or free, worth the purchase of a plot of land for our bones to rest in. Later in the same poem, Look, I said contained and could not mean, shackled, contained, and there is no iron, but the blood, the blood unspoiled, the blood unsullied by clay, by the bark of night. 
our people growing like a lineage of trees, poem in which our mouths are orchards towards the Egun. And of course, you know, Egun means ancestor. And so I start this reading by reading Oriel Marie's poem about ancestor, about those long gone and those recently gone, like Camila, Aisha, Moon. But how we form a continuity with those folks and how they, in, in some ways, stay with us always. We carry them forward into the future they dreamt about. Reading from Jennifer, Jennifer's poem, the first few lines took my breath away. When you write your mother's obituary, she will be sitting next to you. Her face unflinched in death's redundant river. You will carefully write the scripture she wants as her battle cry. You will write your own name among the list of survivors. When you write your mother's obituary, she will tell you to record her funeral arrangements. No pink, only purple flowers. Do not spend too much money on the flowers. Bury me in St. Mark, not Jerusalem. Don't bury me in them woods. Don't put no picture on my obituary. I don't want to be face down in some ditch somewhere. Have them sing, I'll fly away when they wheel me out. And to conclude with a bit of humor and lightness, also from Jennifer Boykin's poem, Cravings. Firebomb barbecue chicken leg was the last chicken you ate when you became a pescatarian and stopped eating chicken. When you think of them poor chicks in them cages, in them chicken farms with them antibiotics and the broken beaks, when you substitute chicken with cauliflower wings and some other magic called vegan chicken, when you go four years without eating chicken, when you don't give a damn about Popeye's chicken sandwich, but you still know that yard bird is better than anything they sell at the IGA because your neighbors kept chickens in their coops and your ears don't sigh at the rooster crowing at midnight when the smell of any meat cooking, but especially frying, makes you a little weak, but you stay strong when you become pregnant with your first child and you begin to crave chicken. You will order the lemon pepper wings because the baby said, vegan chicken, what? That's not my bloodline. Thank you, Oriel. Thank you, Jennifer, for these poems. I thought I'd begin today um, reading from my new and selected, whoop, there you go, new and selected, jump the clock. Reader, we were meant to beat and not disappear in the dredging. The edited ledgers omit antiphonal groans. Reader, you were meant to be legible, even in the failure to communicate, your will to resist snatching defeat from the jaws of easy victory. The truth slips in as a figure of speech. 
Reader, step into my room. This page faces you. What will I miss if you blink? What blots the ink, pens, and hems the imagination? What hides in the brackish backstories hostile to the wobbled word? What resists being pinned to the truth? Reader, we are carbon and more. The exact degree of life is inestimable. Some of us chew ice and others suck chalk. Some crave salt before there is savor. Others can never be too full of sugar or bourbon, sucker punched and stunned by death's pugnacious brawl. Into dream time and song, extending both ends night into day. Touch, reader. We were meant to touch, to exchange definitions and feed the pulse of language. I promise if you step in, it will propel you and me. It, it will topple distinctions. It'll ease doubt and belief and all that lies in between. Fool for love. I cannot claim rigor or music, blindfold or hormone heated hunger. I cannot claim ache, my bulb dimmed or exhausted. The binary phantom has stopped breathing calamity in my direction. I cannot claim mistaken identity or a hole in the cards of singularity, a dull solitaire never wins or loses. I cannot claim habit haunts an empty chair or drives me to disestablished echo. I cannot claim arousal by flame sputter, fire drowned in crackle. I cannot claim amnesia, that abandoned plastic bag bursting testimonies by the curb discarded with damp coffee grinds. I cannot claim perfect enthusiasm. I grit my risk against high drama, yet flowers appear eye to eye. I cannot claim my grain is porous and thunder ready to soak in less heaven and more earth, a ton of mud. I cannot claim my double won't appear when I least expect her, throwing a tantrum and some galoshes, following her thumbprints. She blows things out of proportion and she doesn't always use her name. Hey, shout out to the sisters in session who are joining us for this reading. So glad you could be here. I'm so glad to be reading with you. That first poem, Reader We Were Meant to Meet, well, I hope we do all meet someday, that we won't always be two-dimensional and that we will be able to grab each other with in three dimensions in real life, not just on a screen. I'll read, um, I'll read another of these arguments that I'm always having in my poems. From a handbook of quarrels. How what they say about you makes it say itself through you. I'll say that again. From how what they say about you makes it say itself through you. It's thought bubbles overheard it's close captioned in your voice. It's inserted like a chip in the back of your head. The king is dead and long live Elvis impersonators. They're the only ones who receive royalties now. Quote the original tenants. They leave their empty suits to writhe on stage, booty bump and drop to feed, hungry beats ripping. They're harmless in a televised cage. There is no danger here anymore, so they say. They got all the signifiers they need. Nigger is a household word, domesticated by suicide ideation officers 
who look just like you. Today, they are looking out for the color struck and the color stuck, hue by hue, dead or alive, color drained and poured back into. How speech enacts domination becomes the vehicle through which social structure is reinstated. The words puncture the skin in friendly fire, so familiar, it deafens. Is that the speaker? Is the speaker the puppet or the puppeteer? A sleight of hand, an ancient forgery, conducted in a language so under the skin, we think we are speaking our own thoughts. At the end of the line, is that a noose or a question mark? This is an endly, this is a sort of, this is a, a, um, a ceasefire here. <laughs> the Massacre of Rocks, it's a truce. It's a truce poem about love. One. Then when I was loving intemperate, loving freely, loving inventing, love, for its first time, I took no oaths as seriously as I took imagination to penetrate fog, raising sight to a person to help me invent myself more in the future, a scarlet reception, enthusiastic, guilt-free, musical. I wanted love to look like me from the inside out. I wanted to look more like me by looking outside. I wanted to remind myself to look. I reminded myself constantly of how I looked and looked for constant reminders, a love that needed no naming, no further description. I was its author, its primary reader, named, no need of reminding. I called and I answered. This love without measure was constantly measured, measuring all I imagined, a hard body. <laughs> A soft body, a sharp face, the chin stubble, mm, chin tickling, wrinkled, smiling or frowning, a love of extreme insinuation, unreined, my brain's desire to be loved for myself, loving one's beloved thought and hearing it answer, yes, yes, even as the eyes of the beloved are fixed somewhere overhead. The discovery of love, an original climaxing phantom embered in random sensory touch. Oh, thermal blankets, thermals blanket the skin for the night of attainability. I loved the melodies in elbows and knees, collapsing on the bed, breaking the seals on the bottle, spilling the long sought magic beans. Two, in too deep. Even at the brink, the steep is almost always an accident. Playing at the edge is intoxicating. Precisely emphatic, to be interrogated, empathy or centrifugal motion varies the flow of blood from old wounds to new pleasures. The way one can grow to like licking the radiant raises the temperature from the dry, renumbers the scale from clitoris to heart. This is a work of falling apart. This is a piece of work. This is the hollow left by reorganized weather, quotes looking away. To love being tied to love, to retie the knots, to love retying the knots, to love or not to be to love being braced for the worst and the worst arriving just as anticipated in a white van with expired plates to love love's knocks and bruises those tin pen alley contusions balladic abuses abuses suspense 
and Vaseline-coated lenses indemnify the past, regrets the rain of blue, its spectrum of undying love. The price of love. The price of loving like that. The king of love, the queen of love, the royalty of love. Love's enormous, inescapable grip. Only a noose could be so tight. Three, fluent. Baby and bath water have come to an agreement. Rain has made this easy. Time gets the details in order. Clear in the morning, followed by a mix of sun and clouds, such as when you stick to the subject. The verbs appear to disobey, but they follow Foth's arrow, a partner to the breeze. Then love becomes not a destination, but a close reading. I'm going to read a little bit from Veronica from V Suite. doing for time. Oh, we're doing good. Okay, got a few minutes. Someone matching your description. I should say a little bit about this. This is a, uh, a group of poems called Veronica, A Sweet Next Parts. And um, I, um, and I really wrote this after, um, I guess I started reading this after Sandra Bland's um, being stopped on the road. And um, I, I just, you know, I began to understand that um, and to really allow myself to feel a, um, being a black mother of adult children, both a um, young man and a young woman. So I started I started to really let myself feel and let myself step into the shoes of black mothers and that lineage of women who watch their children out in the world and realize that's their heart externalized in a world that's anti-black and violent, hostile. Veronica is my, kind of my alter ego. Someone matching your description. You wake me up, Veronica, to escort you to the door of the unknown, and I am slapped awake and paperless. My eyeglasses abandoned on the ledge, I'm startled, a tongue triggered dry, staring into eyes emptied of the exact shape of mercy. Those eyes are ice. You, Veronica, are beside yourself, your face a burned down house. Count me in so I can walk with you, Veronica, though you are mostly alone, even dry-eyed at your own funeral. Even being of two minds is not enough when Jacob wrestled with an angel. I wonder who wrestles with me now, or you even, to argue reasonable doubt when I know they never leave their guns. They carry them everywhere, into churches, bars, courtrooms. They put scare quotes around the world. They are never mistaken. There are no words for mistake, no words for mistake, for no reason for indefinite registered. They speak in a prose that refuses to be tamed by thoughts, inflection, always mad as hornets in a front pocket. They are inedible stuck on the fear of deserved reprisal, the ax that never quite falls. Hold that thread piece, please. So they call to quarry, prey, footstool, and chattel, someone's back to stand on, to enable them to climb the ladder faster, unletter the ladder faster. There are no words for mistake, no obvious thread that binds the master to the missing supply of mastery. Even sleeping history's abolished fictions live on absent the bigot, whose afterthought is our undermine. 
they have just one way of knowing what is known from before and knowing what the owners of copious knowing know without speaking, say without saying exactly, be my scapegoat, my sex toy, my just dessert, my bowl of candy profits, my pencil thought, my extinction. Ghost names. Veronica, whose ghost name is Vita, wept to be a grandmother at 35 for Don't Stone's desire to be touched. Veronica, whose ghost name was Yvette, who other girls lay in wait to fight her every day bitten by one fierce girl while others laugh so out of body they never noticed the bites carrot wow the bites scarring their own bituminous skin i just remembered the people who are named in this poem veronica whose ghost name was evelyn was murdered by her husband for even a rock wants to dance not to be hurled and broken orphaning children and children's children Veronica, whose ghost name was Henrietta, brought from Antigua at 16 to warm a stone of a man, almost three times her age, outlived him and her seven children. Veronica, whose ghost name is Martha, whose rage at martyrdom turned her arms into resting missiles, all knew never to cross. See, the heart moves from one side to the other, catastrophe, or gets hit in the forehead, or shoved always out of nowhere, pulled by the reins of female obedience that's killing us. <clears throat> okay. Let's see. I'm going to skip around a little bit. Uh, here. Upon another acquittal, choreography of grief from Amy Till, Sabrina Fulton, Samira Rice, and Geneva, Geneva Reed Deal. <clears throat> she had needed to heal, but she had promised. Her blues angled, slipped out, capsized, traveled a long distance, as if underwater when the sun cast a blurry silence and looking refused border, filling her mouth with scorch. And when I saw her fall into herself, not her first grief and crumple in an instant, knowing no justice will ever be found, could be found, where nothing is said out loud. And when it is said, or wailed. The something said is something that no one hears. Everything will be taken from you. Even more than you know will be taken away. And it will sever you. It will make you swerve. Stagger as if punched in the heart or in a part you can't easily name. Talked over punched into so you pivot as if possible to get out of the way i write as if words will suspend your fall gentle you when there is no departing agony read two more poems this is a hard poem to read but i do like to read it it's called broken english it's a lamentation. Wound up in words, wounded, re-wounded, the beaten, bulleted body repeats, wound, reads into ache, stead, 
or uh, red, 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 or ready, or not, but red, red, be broken, s s s Spent. It's not better. Remember, red. It tenders. Speechless. Ten. Ten. It. Kindred like. Killing into bro, 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 can states render, 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 rendering illegible and unintelligible. Where black, 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 this support. Suppressed by laws severed, severed to cow, to cow, cow us and scowl us dead. Mute. Yet she, I, to speak all at once the thing that has been on her, my mind, which words, verbs, recover dignity, restores let, let, letters to the unmuffled, unmuzzled, full-throated sound as in somebody, d the dead, the deadlines teach the proper order of time, the zones of properties, Intention returns me day after day to variations of the question how to breathe freely. Despite shackle, rattle, and pummeled jolts, where does glare recede? When do words lead to care? Be on sight and out of sight, a path to better resist. Last poem. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave you there. <laughs> this is where love comes in. There's so much to do for justice. We're running out of brink, so I grab my socks and pull them up. I slip the latch on my one-track mind. I avoid the chair that catches me with a nap. I point my feet in the left direction, prove I am all ears. Work with the pivot, the hip, the city, its dance map. I avoid the cemetery of stubborn spots. I avoid walks with a slow crawl and notice the furnished detours along the way. Each step one takes in public jars the partially apprehended panorama of the cookie cutter's regrets and is an occasion to learn from the field of the interior. Here, the street, the home, catalog, collected histories of first aid and relief, post no bills on dread, seek out uncollectibles, be uh, suspicious of fancier goods lost than found, bravery starts from the bottom, love notes, warriors send souvenirs home. This is where love comes in. Coat on or coat off, hat on, hat off. Go back for the gloves, go back for the umbrella, go back for the scarf, go back for the orange plastic glasses, go back for, go back, go back. There they're wearing their rain boots with the frog faces on the toes. Both the kids like their boots, their small hands fit perfectly into mine. Let few events escape. They mark every page like a bookmark as if joy was dropped on the path a few days ago and will show up later in the melting snow. Thank you.
So I'm ready for questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm reading two things here now, the text and the chats. Okay, while people gather, I have a few, I have a few uh, front-loaded questions. And, um, okay. My most dramatic encounter with a poem uh, was, uh, so Harriet Mullen came to visit me in New York. This had to be about 20 years ago yeah, or more and came to visit and stayed. And um, uh, she asked me, she said, you know, Erica, let's go see Gwendolyn Brooks read and, and, uh, at St. Peter's. It's a church in Midtown. It's known as the Jazz Church. And um, yeah, so we went and saw Gwendolyn Brooks, the place was packed. And uh, that was actually the most dramatic reading. I, first of all, I had no idea what Gwendolyn Brooks sounded like. So hearing her read her own work was a revelation. And it persuaded me that I, that really we, that the performance practice for um, black poetry is the door is wide open for any kind of performance practice you can imagine. But hearing her read was the most dramatic encounter. Okay, so there are questions in the chat now. Describe my writing creative practice. Yes, as I was saying, I am, um, I've kept journals for 52 years. Um, and uh, I sometimes there are pieces of poems there. Sometimes it's really just, you know, what happened that day or it's me processing. But frequently there are um, lines and parts of poems that are in that journal, in the journal. And there's, you know, I haven't, I, I feel like I've always just, just begun to skim the surface of that. And uh, so that, but I go back and forth. I, um, uh, I'll go back into a journal and I'll take a line and use that as a prompt. Um, but uh, often current events are prompts for me too, as the Veronica suite really was prompted by, um, you know, um, uh, uh, many events. And uh, I started to, I had a dream that I was, you know, I was talking to this person, Veronica, and I realized you know, as they say about dreams, every person in the dream is really an aspect of yourself. And so, you know, I said, oh yeah, this is me, finally. You know, let me step in and talk to Veronica. So that's a process point. Yes, thank you. Much love also. Hello to the sisters in session. So glad you could join. Yeah, um, their eyes are like ice. Oh no, <laughs> no, eyes like ice are like, that, that's about a coldness in the eyes. Um, uh, that's to respond to that question. Uh, so the eyes weren't, it wasn't referring to immigration. <laughs> yeah, the lamentation. So that's that I decided to break up broken English, right? It's a, a lament. The, Veronica is entirely almost a, a lamentation uh, with a few exceptions, but the broken English is when the language fails, right? And it's about how to even begin to use language again <laughs> after it seems to have failed. Um, there are no words, but also um, I think about uh, something um, Theodore Adorno is said to have said that, you know, is poetry possible after Auschwitz? Is poetry possible after MAFA, uh, the Black Holocaust? Is it possible after this prolonged, you know, these, these many years? Um, 
of uh, not enough change. So, um, poets that um, I thought I would talk about some poets that I'm interested in right now. Not enough people know them, um, and that's I wanted to t to uh, raise up for people uh, Dion Brand and the Blue Clerk, um, who's a Canadian Afro Af Afro Canadian Afro Caribbean poet, um, uh, and her book The Blue Clerk. She's got many other books. Um, the book for which she is probably best known is, um, geez, it's right here in the big stack. Oh, um, the door to, what is it? The, the door to no return, the passage, the doorway to no return, um, which of course is about uh, one of the slave castles in Ghana. There it is, a, sh a map to the door of no return. That's the full title. Um, the other person I wanted to talk about uh, today was uh, Renee Gladman. Um, her book, Calamities. She begins each entry with this phrase. I began the day trying. I began the day asking. And then she writes from there. And each section belongs, uh, uh, opens that way. Um, also, um, African-American poet, South Carolina, I think. Um, who else would, oh yeah, and Jay Wright. Everybody should know Jay Wright. Um, he's older, he must be in his 80s. And um, Jay Wright is, oh good, someone is reading uh, Map to the Map of No Return, Map to the Door of No Return. That's excellent, excellent, yeah. Um, Jay Wright is an older poet. He won the Bowling Gen a while ago. He's in his 80s. Um, Transfigurations. This poet is like the quiet, as quiet as it's kept, he's been an influence on so many other poets. He's been a big influence on um, Nate Mackey, on Ed Roberson, on, um, you know, we can go through the black poets he's influenced. Um, he's, um, and his, he's got a gorgeous ear. I was lucky enough to see him read maybe four or five years ago, completely musical poet. You know, just exquisite. He was a jazz bassist at one point. He lives in the Southwest. No, he lives in Vermont, but he lived in the Southwest for many years. And so he blends together, um, you know, African American. He's, well, first of all, he's all about myth. So it's like African, African American, and Latino and Mexicano and indigenous mythologies that he weaves together. The other questions. Oh, books for the present moment. Well, the books that the book that I'm reading right now is um. Oh God, <laughs> Whoa, this happens to me all the time. Um. By Justin Philip Reed. And I'll look for a minute. I don't know why it just went right out of my head like that. Um, not indecency. What's the book? His work is dense and yes. Uh huh. Hold on. Um, children. I do recommend indecency. But there's a second book <laughs> that I'm trying to remember right now. Mm. Oh, here it is, The Malevolent Volume. The Malevolent Volume, yeah. Man, this, this cat can write. Um, they're really a very strong, beautiful writer, full of rage, and also full of a kind of transcendence again, understanding that there are principles at work. Yes, it is malevolent volume. There are principles at work that are that are old stories, 
that animate our present time. Here we go. <laughs> That's good. And what am I reading right now? Ooh, okay. Hmm. I'm reading a lot. <laughs> I'm reading a. I'm reading a lot. If you looked at my desk, you would like go, "Oh, what are you reading right now? Which of these many, many books?" But um, I'll I'll show you what just came in the mail right now, and then we can go from there. Because I'm I'm a little bit of a a bookaholic. <laughs> First of all, I have read most of these, but I just got this doorstop of a book, The Complete Poetry of M.A. Césaire, who I adore. I discovered when I was in, oh, well, let's see. Ooh, see how big that is? Oops, see how big that is? That's a big book. He wrote a lot. M.A. Césaire was a Martinican poet who, along with Leopold Senghor, was uh, 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 the founder, created something called Negritude. They were inspired by the Harlem Renaissance, by Langston Hughes and others. And as Caribbean, Franco, you know, Francophonic Caribbean, well, Senghor was Senegal, right? And Césaire was from Martinique, and they met as college students in Paris. Yes, this cover, right? This is Wilfredo Lamb, for those of you who, uh, uh, with whom he collaborated, Césaire collaborated. And uh, they, they created this idea of negritude, which was a kind of early version of, you know, kind of blackness of nationalism, black, you know, black personhood. Um, okay, other show and tell. What came through the door this just this week? Tina Camp's new book, A Black Gaze. Do you know about Tina Camp? Tina is a, a historian photographic historian who specializes in um, black portraiture, usually archival and usually documentary photographs. But this book, uh, A Black Gaze, Artists Changing How We See, is uh, our full length essays on photographers um, such as um, Deanna Lawson and Dawood Bey and um, uh, Arthur Jaffa, Jaffa, but also, uh, lovely enough, on Simone Lay, who's a, a friend and a sculptor, as well as filmmaker, and includes a few um, images from, actually, a few images, Let's see if I can get a good one here, this one. This is from my daughter's film, that image. See it? Who works with Simone Lee. Other questions? That's what I'm reading lately. OK, questions. Do you have any advice on how to include poetry into classes outside of the humanities? Yes. So. Um, I've taught a class uh, called uh, um, Poetry in the Archives. And I look at uh, how black poets and writers are going into the archives to find material for, uh, for their writing. And so in any context where you're teaching um, about African American history, there's there's going to be, particularly now, work that tries to go into the archive and reframe it, reframes the historical record using poetic techniques and the poetic imagination. We know so often when we look at the history of black people in America that they don't want to talk about us though we are a constant presence, as Toni Morrison points out. But it is actually having to go back into the archive 
and re-seeing it and also almost putting oneself into the picture that we get a fuller picture of some of the black lives in the past. So the people I recommend are, you know, anywhere from Robert, uh, Robin Cost Lewis or John Keane or Saidia Hartman or Honoré Jeffers and her book, The Age of Phyllis, or, um, oh my goodness, for poets to, um, who are looking in a very creative way or want to, you know, even a, a, a cultural historian like Saidia Hartman wants to in fact use some of the tools of poetry in order to reimagine right what the lives what lives what humanity um what were the perceptions experiences feelings of the people who are otherwise pretty flattened in the historical record does that answer that question uh yeah, Providence. Well, I actually live in Brooklyn, but I get up to Providence once a week <laughs> to teach. So, um, yes, John, um, uh, I hope that we will have occasion to cross paths in the in the three D world. Uh, rejuvenating practices. What's a good, that's a good idea. So, um, yeah, I take long walks. Uh, I live near the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, so I go walk in that garden. And the other rejuvenating practice, Lauren, is that I get my toenails done. <laughs> Those two things together, long walks <laughs> and pedicures, that'll cure a, a host of ailments. <laughs> but again, I also think music is amazing, and I learn so much listening to all kinds of music. Um, uh, you know, I learn so much listening to all kinds of music, and I especially learn about form, you know, about how, composition. How do you put? That's right. The Furious Flower Reading Series is re a rejuvenation tool as well. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Is that, that's good. Well, I want to thank you for um, joining me in this reading conversation format. And um, what's one thing you try to give your students? Mm. Mm. Well, one thing, I actually try to give them so much. I want to give them this sense that poetry, in poetry, you can do a kind of thinking that you can't do in ordinary language. And um, that the thinking that you do in poetry allows you to make connections between things that um, are supposedly not connected in ordinary discourse, they say, oh no, this, you know, the blue of the sky is not related to the blue of the lake at all. But in fact, there is a kind of connection and poets do that very well. But um, I also wanna say that uh, poetry is an, I believe is an indispensable tool for imagining alternatives to the ways that we organize the world now. And, um, I do believe that it's the path through poetry with all of its difficulty, because people say, oh, poetry's so difficult and it's so, why don't they just say it straight? Well, in some ways, saying it in the way that it is said and suggesting alternatives and imposing a kind of difficulty in reading is actually a good practice for the kinds of thinking, the kinds of alternative ways of thinking and the kinds of, um, uh, uh, 
uh, possibilities and potential ways that we could be living with each other. And it's not an easy path. Otherwise, we would be there already. It's obviously something difficult. So difficulty and slowness, the difficulty and slowness of poetry is actually salutary. It's good that we get it somewhere where it's how we get to a meaning and perhaps to a kind of a preferred, a preferred way of living with each other. Right, a preferred humanity, a larger sense of humanity. So once again, friends, it's um, good to be here with you. I'm so glad that we could spend some time on a Friday afternoon I'm very appreciative. Thank you. It's a deep bow. Deep bow to you all. Thank you. Hope to see you in the flesh, Sharon, and also to Lauren and two others there. I hope our paths cross.